evening, everyone. So we called our meeting to order during our closed executive session, so we can begin our meeting. Uh, before we do, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Toscano for some changes to the agenda. Good evening, Madam President. Uh, in addition to the items that were, that were pre-printed on the agenda uh, for this evening, just wanted to note that <laughs> um, just to note that for number four, the contract negotiations were with the WWPAA, not with the WWPEA, uh, and that uh, for number nine, uh, the board did not discuss HIV matters. And uh, Madam President, if it's, if it's okay, just uh, one other item, um, just in light of uh, uh, schedules, um, there was some discussion about uh, a motion to go out of order. Uh, in order to take care of a, a personnel item. So uh, if, if there is interest, uh, the motion would be a uh, motion to go out of order to proceed to a personnel appointment. Okay, great. So can I get a, uh, a motion to go out of order? Uh, Pooja and Shrata? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and then uh, the motion would actually be uh, uh, the motion to uh, Change and appoint Maureen Cook as a uh, principal. Uh, change from assistant principal to principal, replacing Michael Wellborn, who is retiring. Thank you. So can I have a motion, please? Uh, Lloyd and Robin. That's Any a roll call. Yep. Any questions or comments? Chris? Okay, we'll start with Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Thanks, Ms. Ms. Fruit. Yes. Ms. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Zobis. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. Congratulations. So just uh, for the good of the audience that's here in person with us, um, Dr. Wellborn's the one with the glow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, thank you for your 21 years of service to Wyckoff as the principal, um, and uh, to his right, uh, Maureen Cook, our uh, newly appointed um, principal. Um, we had the great pleasure to um, appoint Maureen as the Wyckoff assistant principal of February 2021. Uh, they've been a team together the last two school years. Prior to being at um, Maureen's, uh, sorry, at Wyckoff, uh, Ms. Cook was the pr assistant principal of our Grover Middle School. Uh, before she joined us at Grover, uh, she also served as a middle school special education teacher, an elementary first grade teacher, an elementary basic skills teacher, and a reading specialist, and an elementary instru instructional coach. Uh, she brings a great uh, variety of uh, services and experiences, uh, both elementary and middle school. Um, she's been a dynamic partner with Dr. Wellborn and Ms. Kalingo, who's in the audience, as well supporting. Um, and. I just want to say uh, just congratulations to Maureen. She's going to be a fantastic addition to the principalship and WWP, an amazing member of our team. And um, the staff, the, and the and to the staff and the PTA leadership that participated in the process, I just want to say thank you to them um, and congratulations to Maureen. Thank you. And again, congratulations, Dr. Wellborn. And we, we will miss you, uh, you know, for we have a number of Wyckoff parents on the board, so uh, we've had a lot of great experiences with you. So have a great retirement, and congratulations. Um, Ms. Cook, appreciate it. Okay, so we'll now turn to our presentation, the multi-level classes presentation, um, which will be given by Dr. Gould and Ms. Andrea Bean. Let's try again. Got it. Perfect. I can also talk really loud because I taught in open space, which I don't know if you know we have that still. Um, hi, I'm Andrew Bean. I'm a supervisor of uh, curriculum and instruction for the district, and uh, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting us to talk about multi-level classes. I'm Barbara Gould, and I'm the Director of Counseling, Health and Wellness for the District. Um, we're really excited to be able to share this initiative and this experience uh, with the board and with the community, um, as we really feel that it serves our students really well.
So we're going to start with just a slight review of the district goals because everything that we do um, links back to our goals because that's what the strategic planning gave us that represents the values of our community and our district. Um, so just a quick review, goal number one is personalized learning. That's where we look at each student as an individual and set them on their learning journey and support them as needed. Goal two is a global citizenship where we're looking for students to think of things from different perspectives and participate actively in the world around them. Goal three is social emotional. Uh, that's two pronged. Um, one is the environment that students are in and the social emotional um, the feeling of wellness in school and the ability to feel confident. And it's also teaching them about social and emotional skills and um, the things that are related to how to manage your emotions and how to manage social situations and things like that. Our fourth goal is equity. Um, and that's about making sure that everybody has a place and that um, they feel that they belong in the district, that our district's inclusive um, and that we welcome everyone and that we celebrate um, each and every person regardless of where they came from, what they look like, who they are. Um, we belong together, we're a community. So multi-level courses are one of the ways that we are achieving our goals. Um, so currently we have multi-level courses in seventh grade math, eighth grade algebra one, ninth grade algebra two, and world history in ninth grade. Um, Next year, we will be adding multi-level classes in biology, which is a ninth grade course, and language arts one, uh, which is also a ninth grade course. So how do these multi-level classes help us meet our goals? Uh, first and foremost, they provide flexibility in learning, enabling teachers to meet students where they are. Um, when students are mixed together, and the teachers are teaching both college prep um, and honors, and we call that CP sometimes, it's college prep. Um, in the same room, there's a multitude of resources for students. Uh, there's small group instruction to help meet their needs. And they can move flexibly and start where they're comfortable and build their skills from there. Uh, it maximizes the benefits of divergent thinking. Um, I have an interesting story about this. Um, I was in a classroom where they were doing number sense, and they were finding many ways to represent this algebraic expression. And um, most of the students, they were sitting mixed um, college prep and honor students together. And a group of the students were, we can use exponents, we could use uh, parentheses, we can do this, we can do that. And one young lady said, what if we tried to do it visually? And all the honors kids at the table like recoiled and like, what are, what are you talking about? This is math class, we are not drawing this. And she said, I think we could blow everybody's mind if we could do this visually. And they had the greatest conversation about how to represent this algebraic expression visually and it really deepened their thinking. Um, because when you have different types of thinkers together, the thinking is better. Um, it removes the barriers that naturally occur in groupings. When children are separated, there are things that they learn in the honors class that college prep kids never get exposed to. Um, and when they're separated, there are things that the college prep kids have access to that may support and help them that maybe the honors students do not. But when it's the same teacher with all the resources, those barriers are removed. Another way that it supports is the transition between eighth and ninth grade. Um, so our students, you know, making choices in eighth grade, they're making choices about their, co uh, their high school experience. And sometimes those choices are made without a lot of information and knowledge about what an honors class might look like, right? And so this gives them the opportunity to be able to, especially since in middle school, they've now had honors and college prep in the same classroom in our multi-level. And they are now able to have a more informed decision when they're making choices about classes as they move forward. Um, the other way that it supports, one of our goals in looking at this is when we have all four content areas, we are also going to look at, not next year, but the following year, how we could group students together or house them, like an academy or a team model that we use at the middle school. So having teachers, um, 
who are able to you know, have a group of students that they all work together to serve. And therefore, there's communication about things such as you know, when assessments take place or if a student might be um, struggling. Um, teachers might say, you know, oh, I have that student in my particular class and they're doing great. Here are some strategies that you can utilize that might be effective for you, just like we do with teaming in middle school. And this provides a nice transition for our students from eighth into ninth grade. So that is one goal as well um, that multi-level classes helps to support, um, which also improves their social emotional learning, right? Um, making sure that students are able to take some risks in high school, but it also being flexible as Andrea mentioned, um, and that those risks are supported by the teachers. The other um, part that it supports our goal is related to you know, increasing our underrepresented groups in honors courses. I mean, there's tons and tons of research that will show you, you know, that certain groups, whether it be socioeconomic or gender, for example, um, in our own district, we do have fewer females taking higher level math courses and science courses. And this is an opportunity for us to start looking at how do we encourage um, our young ladies to pursue some of these um, opportunities because they're exposed to the content in a multi-level class. It also provides um, equitable and inclusive opportunities for all students. That high-level thinking is available to, to every learner. Now we're going to show you a little bit about how teachers describe what a multi-level classroom looks like. So a typical day in our math classroom, um, Nick's going to talk a little bit more specifically, but in the math department we follow uh, what they call the math workshop model, which has three different components. But one of the components that we use very often in our classroom, which we definitely find works very well with the mixed classes, is we usually start with a number sense, with the idea being that when kids come to your class, there is a transition from their previous class to the new class, getting them ready to learn math. But then also the number sense is designed so everyone can participate and everyone can um, you know, come up with an answer. Um, then we usually transition into a focus lesson. And then after the focus lesson, there is usually some type of choice and activity, whether it be stations or um, a different choice of just a type of activity, whether it be digital or a matching or a Google Slides or something to that. And then we end our class periods with a by re reflection on what had happened throughout the day. So in our class, so in our class, uh, like Cheryl Ann said, we have a, I call it like a number sense, where it just brings everyone in, everyone has an entry point, which is really important in the mixed level class. From there, we go into our focus lesson. Because it's a mixed level class, I try to give a problem uh, kind of at that honors level, but bringing the entire class into it. I try to keep that to about 10 to 15 minutes. That way I have a lot of time working with the stations so that everyone can uh, have time to practice the skill and the concept. When we move into the stations, we set it up with the structure of like three different levels. So level one would be a reteaching moment. There's some guided notes, maybe a video involved. Level two is where I say I really want my, uh, my uh, my non-honors to be at. Then my level three is where I say I would like my honors level to be at. But every student has a choice of where they want to start. For some classes, we have a bit of a check-in. It's a self-assessment for the students that allows them the opportunity to decide where they should start. If they start at level two, for example, for an honor student, that's great. Right? It allows them to, to build up their skill, build up their confidence. So that way, when they get to the level three, they're ready to go. For the non-honor student, if they want to try that level three, they have the ability to be exposed to it and need to work on it with their peers. After that, we finish up with a reflection and a debrief as to how the day went. And, you know, a while ago, I put together a lesson about 
and technological disruptors. And it's kind of a lead into the global industrial revolution. Or change the world and get kids talking about Uber, Airbnb, and now AI. I want them to engage in conversations. And it was an honors level lesson at first, and then I worked with the teacher resource specialists, and we decided that maybe not every kid knows about, you know, every single one of those tech instructors. So we created these scaffolds with the written descriptions that students could read beforehand. It helped out a lot. This year in the multi-level class, and it's something that every kid can engage with. And it doesn't just kind of engage the CP kids. We, we promise to come back to the teachers, um, because truly they are the experts in this work. However, um, wanted to talk a little bit about more just logistical and, and important facts of how do multi-level classes work. So one of the things that is important to keep in mind is that there are components that are consistent for all students. So for example, um, our New Jersey standards and our curricula in a multi-level class is the same. And this has always been the case. Um, there were never biology honor standards and biology standards. There are only biology standards, right? And so in a multi-level class, all students are exposed to the same standards um, and therefore have the same expectations for the levels of skill um, and content that they are supposed to master. Uh, the other piece, is that the curricula will also be the same. Um, we are working on revising some of the curriculum this summer in order to, to make that happen. In addition, obviously, we talked about college prep and honors students being in the same classroom. There's tons of student choice. So in speaking with numerous students, I would say this is the number one thing that students talk about and use to describe what a multi-level class looks like. Um, they talk about the opportunity to really make decisions as learners about their own learning, where they feel comfortable starting, um, where they feel comfortable going next, and that there's a lot of support for that. And those decisions are made obviously with um, you know with teacher input with teacher conference with teachers meeting with students and having those conversations and then also with check-ins and self-reflections that students are exposed to uh, differentiated learning so we are making sure that you know there are opportunities for all students to learn that resources support students where they are teachers are checking in frequently um, and that it's a learning community where every student, you know, belongs. And I think one of the biggest questions I had before speaking with students was this idea of, you know, are students separated in the class, right? Are like honors kids put on one side and then college prep students put on the other side? And that's not at all what it looks like. It's very integrated. The groups are very mixed. Um, and students don't really know which student is college prep and which one is honors. They sort of just work collaboratively together. And that was repeatedly shared from students over and over in conversations that both Andrea and I and others have had with students as well. Some of the components that might look a little bit differently, you can see them here. Um, the assessments might have different expectations. For example, in a math assessment, um, for an honor student, they may need to apply the material a little bit differently. They may have to, you know, extend their learning or um, create something that is more critical thinking in regards to the content that they already learned, as that might look differently for a college prep student, right? Um, our tasks might be different. The text sets, meaning the reading levels of the material that students are utilizing might be different. Um, as a way to provide access for students where they are and meet them where they are. As you know, you know, the GPA weight is another thing that is different for students in a multi-level class. So some of the benefits, there's a ton of them on this slide. I'm not going to read and comment on every single one of them for you, but I'm going to highlight a couple of them. Um, the first that I'm going to highlight is that it helps reduce the negative effects of tracking. Um, tracking is when students get into like one level um, and that's where they're, they stay, right? So you're in college prep in grade seven math and now you're in college prep forever. Um, we know that tracking is, is not great for students. The research is very clear that um, as they learn and grow, they need flexibility to seek their passions and they mature and they find different interests. Um, so by being in multi-level classes, they're exposed to both 
types of material, both types of questions, so that as they mature and grow and as learners, um, they're not stuck in any one place. We're trying to keep as many doors open for our students as humanly possible. Um, it provides teachers talking points for helping students with their 10th grade classes. Um, so teachers can talk to students, right? Oh, I see that you are capable of doing more. I see this. You, you might not have chose honors this year, but you can choose it next year. Let's talk about this. How would we get ready if that's your goal? Um, or some students may say, you know what? I need to pull back and the teacher can say that's great how are we going to do that how are we going to still keep you learning and growing um, and feeling great about your journey and pulling back because your passions have changed or you want to play a varsity sport or or any of those things and this way teachers aren't just talking about figurative things right they have the honors material in front of them the kids can see what the differences are by comparing themselves um, and student choice equals more engagement. We see this all along. When students can start where they're comfortable and build, they're more engaged. Um, nothing's worse than having a kid that's bored and the teacher doesn't have the next enrichment thing, right? Or to have a student that's starting at a level where they're just not quite there with this skill Right, um, and the teacher doesn't have the right scaffold at their fingertips. But working together, the multi-level teachers have a variety of resources to meet all learners so they can be engaged as they make choices of what best fits for them. Ad additional benefits, so um, the increased risk-taking and learning, uh, this is something that teachers have reported in speaking with them and getting their feedback has really um, been demonstrated and you'll hear that next in the video. You know, students taking risks with their learning, really pushing themselves, really um, trying to take on that critical thinking um, and doing it in a safe space, in a safe way, um, so that they feel more confident, right? Um, we talked about increased sense of belonging and I think the last bullet on here to highlight is this idea of uh, better preparation for the real world, meaning that we all work in teams or we all belong in different part, uh, different teams or have led different teams and we know that there are members that have all different ways of thinking, that have different strengths, that have different skills, right? And so multi-level classes is, is great preparation for what it looks like in the real world when you're working in partnerships or in teams. Oops, sorry. Um, so, so we have really found that there's several different benefits for both the CP kid and the honors kids to sort of take off of what Nick was saying with how a typical day looks in our classroom. Uh, one of the things that happens uh, almost every day is we do have the ability to pull small groups. So by keeping your focus lesson down to 10, 15, you know, 20 minutes maybe at most, that leaves us a good chunk of time to then be able to do really one of two things. So you can pull small groups to a table, and sometimes you pull small groups based on skills, sometimes it's just a check-in. Um, but I know that very often that's difficult for me um, because everybody sort of wants your time. So what I find is very often I'll even go to the table um, because when I go to their table, I can sit and my kids all sit mixed. So I have CP and honors at the same table. So I can go to the table, I can say, okay, what are we working on? I want you to try this problem with me. Let's check in on this. And it's definitely a way to meet the kids where they are and to really target what they still have questions with or you know, just really to meet the needs of every single student. So that's definitely like a huge benefit to the math workshop model um, in addition to the lesson. So I, yep, I also uh, do the small group instruction. Uh, for me, it's a little bit different. I don't typically pull to, to a table. I will go to them. Uh, my classroom is set up in a structure where everyone's in a group, also mixed with honors and non-honors. And I can kind of see where they're at with the problems that they're working on. And then from there, either kind of give them a different entry point if they're struggling. And if, or if I see that they're excelling, regardless if it's honors and non-honors at the same table, uh, I can give them an extension that everyone can be working on. 
In addition to that, just some of the benefits for the non-honor student. If let's say they're a high flyer and they want, and they find that they're at level three, you know, every single time, I will give them the ability to take an honors level test and then they can choose for themselves if they want to move up or stay where they're at. For the honors, if they're really struggling and they find that they're at level one and level two most of the time, then I can give them a non-honors level test and they can again make that same decision. For the uh, honors student, if they're struggling, they don't have to start at level three, right? They can start at level one, they can build up that, their skills, they can build up their confidence, they can just like get set with the, the concept before they hit level three where there's that extension. So I, those are a, a lot of the, uh, the benefits of it. For the non-honors, I just think they're being exposed to more, right? For that student that is good with being in, honor, or being in non-honors right now, but maybe next year I wanna try honors, and the year after that I wanna stay in honors, they're just set up so much better. Like they're, they're ready for that because they're being exposed to everything that the honor student is being exposed to. So they can make a calculated decision, an informed decision as to what they should be doing moving forward. You know, one of the things that we observe because both of our kids, uh, both of our classes, they sit in small groups, is that when you walk around the conversations that happen amongst the kids, you would honestly not be able to tell who is CP and who is honors. So sometimes they approach a problem in a very different way, a more creative way, and it's really good to see that communication. And you know, even with the honors kids, like if you have an honors student who is really like getting a concept and their person that's sitting at their table isn't getting it, whether they're honors or not honors, right? They're just solidifying their knowledge by teaching somebody else to teach the other student. And I see that going both ways, right? Between college prep and honors. Um, so I definitely think the whole communication aspect and uh, them being able to learn different ways is definitely a benefit because, you know, they're really learning from each other and how to approach a problem. Or they might be thinking of something that they didn't think of before. Um, so that's definitely um, another benefit, I would say. So for me in history, I think you, you kind of want to get the kids to the same place. You want to you get them to a deeper point of analysis. You want to get to an aha moment. You want to get them kind of reading between the lines of history. And I think it's better when you've got everybody in the same place. They're not all going to get there in the same way. And you've got um, different prompts. Um, you've got different questions, maybe different reading materials. But at the end, I think multi-level helps everybody kind of read between those lines in the end. So next, we're, we'll take a look at what the research says um, about this work. There's tons of research on detracking and the positive impacts of that. Um, there's also a ton of research that can be found on mixed ability classrooms and, and the benefits of those. But this particular research uh, by Taryn and Trevetti uh, takes a look at secondary um, classrooms and when we homogeneously uh, group students. And what impact does that have on student achievement? And then what impact does that have on certain groups of students. And essentially, they had three findings um, in looking at the meta-analysis. The first finding um, shows that there is not a positive uh, correlation between tracking students in a higher track, for example, um, and their student achievement, that really it's null. There's not a significant difference in student achievement. So one of the questions that we had earlier when we shared with parents is have we seen a difference in our student performance? Um, specifically, I would say math would be the best example, just because it's been a few years that we have had mixed uh, we have had mixed level classes in math, and we have not seen students um, not achieve what they've always achieved. So there has not been a negative impact in mixed level classes. 
The second finding um, about this is related to equity. There is a negative impact on equity, however. So for students, as I spoke about um, before, in underrepresented groups in honors classes, when they are tracked, um, as we know, you know, and they are in, they're not exposed to as much content, and therefore there is an impact on their student achievement because they're not exposed to as many opportunities. The third finding, and you'll find this interesting, um, and we have had lots of discussions with teachers, and I think that they will agree with this, is that having a mixed level class is not an easy feat. <laughs> that it does require a lot of intentional planning by teachers and a lot of work um, to make sure that they are differentiating and meeting the needs of all learners. And to that, we do have um, professional development and support for teachers, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So prior to sharing this one, um, I just want to preface this with, you know, I want to proceed with looking at this data very cautiously uh, because the intent here of sharing this is not to have the takeaway that we want more students to be in honors. That is not the goal, right? So, but what this um, particular data shows is that our students in eighth grade, so we took a look at all of our students for the last two years in eighth grade and their eligibility for honors at the high school level. So for example, if you look at, let's look at science um, in 2022, 2023. So 93% of our students, or eighth graders, are eligible for honors. Not all of them choose to take honors but that is for a variety of different reasons, right? Social emotional reasons, they may have other commitments. It may not be a passion area for them and they're not really interested in biology and therefore they don't want to take honors um, for that particular course. All this to say that if you look at how many of our students are eligible for honors, um, we want to keep the door open as Andrea mentioned earlier and so Therefore, you know, multi-level classes allows the opportunity to keep that, that door open for all students. This is my favorite slide because I love talking to students and I've talked to hundreds of them over the past couple years. Um, because what the students are experiencing is really important to us. Um, and the best way for us to find out is to go and ask them. And I have begun to drag people along with me, like Barbara and Dr. Adderhold and Shandrika, and um, we get try to get as many people as we can so that they hear this as well. Um, and so these are just some sample student feedback quotes that I think really hit home the message that we're trying to. Um, you can see in the multi-level class, they um, pretty much confirm what the teachers say, number sense, lesson, we all learn. Um, but what's really interesting is, uh, on the bottom, we can choose where we feel comfortable to start working. Um, and that's great um, because that's what we want. We want kids to have an entry point and build, right? Um, when we ask them how they're grouped, um, again, they're very clear of this. We really don't know who is in honors or college prep. Everybody has access. Everybody can pick. Um, and I do ask them from time to time how they pick. Um, and sometimes they pick because all their friends at the table picked it and they want to work on it together because they're teenagers. Um, but a lot of times they pick what they're interested in and you will see two, two students sitting right next to each other maybe working on something a little bit differently but still working together. Um, because, and, and it's great that they can figure that out and be comfortable. Um, and that's because we do a lot of growth mindset work um, in the elementary school through the teacher resource specialists and they push into classes. And in middle school, there's eight to 12 lessons a year also on growth mindset so that help students realize that we're all on our own learning journeys and that mistakes help us learn and that we're all growing. Um, and so they're more comfortable choosing. Um, and then what's the difference between college uh, um, honors and college prep? I have to tell you this bottom one is my favorite one. So in, um, this, was, this was an eighth grade student. In my other classes, meaning his um, non-multi-level classes. So in my segregated classes. In my other classes, it's about how the class is doing. You know, and he said, you know, like, oh, you all did well on your test, or oh, you know, this was a great class. Um, but in this class, it's about me and how I'm doing. 
Um, and that really gets us back to that treating everybody as an individual. And that kid, he just summed it up perfectly. While she's setting that up, I just want to say our multi-level classes are successful also because we have great teachers. Um, you heard Barb say that it's, it's hard, right? But they work together um, and support each other, um, which you can kind of... So like with that lesson being at, like the focus lesson being at the honors level, uh, even when I, you know, ask a question to the class and you'd be surprised how many non-honor students like raise their hand for that extension piece. Whereas like before, like they would have never been exposed to that. Yeah. And like in our minds, we're like, oh, like it's honors. So, like the non-honors kid, you know, they can't, uh, they can't do it. Yeah. But in reality, like they can. We just needed to give them that opportunity to show it. Yeah. So I think in multi-level, like the idea is you want to, you want to differentiate. You might have different reading materials, different multimedia clips, um, different levels of complexity for, you know, quiz questions. Um, but I've had cases in which there are, you know, students who are CP who come to me and say, listen, I think I can take on the, the bigger thing. And you know, I think I've learned to kind of trust students and trust what they can do. And there are kids that come to me and they want to take on a more analytical question. And, and, and they do it and they, and they succeed. So in that respect, it's been a big success. So how was this communicated to families? If your child's in a multi-level class, how would you know that? Um, so our eighth grade parents come to program of studies presentations, and we get a you know, couple hundred each night um, when we do them. And every supervisor mentioned that the classes would be taught multi-level. Um, so every eighth grade parent was told like, oh, next year biology and biology honors will be taught together in the same room. Um, algebra two and algebra two honors will be taught together in the same room. So it was communicated at both um, program of studies presentations to all of the rising ninth grade or current eighth grade parents. Um, at the back to school nights, every teacher mentions it. It's in their slides, we check. Um, and they're happy to talk about it. You see them on the video. They want to tell parents what they're doing and explain um, how great it is. Uh, eighth and ninth grade PTSA coffee with the principal. Several supervisors have attended that um, and answered questions for parents and been available to parents and also did, talked about it as a topic on the agenda. Uh, both high schools invited supervisors to their PTSA meetings. And again, we answered questions and we brought it up and talked about it. Um, this morning, we showed the same presentation to the PTSA Executive Board, and we're showing it to you here and everybody at home that's streaming. Um, so it's, it's, we're not hiding it. It's out there. We are firmly communicating this is what we do. So what's next for us um, as a district? First, we are in the process of finalizing um, an FAQ with logistics. So parents, do you have questions about things like, you know, when can you switch from honors into college prep? Are there timelines or deadlines for that? How about from college prep into honors? Um, so we want to make sure that that information is available for parents and families to reference. Um, and so we will put that on the website as a place for people to get information. We will also post this presentation along with a slide shows um, and tonight's uh, board meeting as well. Um, we have continuously been monitoring student progress and this is an initiative and a piece that Andrea mentioned is critically important. Talking to kids, looking at their achievement, looking at the impact, speaking with them directly um, and getting, you know, their perspective on how things are going so that we can keep adjusting. You know, if we hear something from a student um, that we want to know more information about or that might be a next step uh, for teachers in terms of professional development, we use that information to make adjustments. And then we have continued uh, teacher professional development and training. 
This summer, uh, the teachers will be attending a summer institute for multi-level, so they will be together for three and a half days um, to talk about this work, what it looks like to differentiate, um, working on gathering more resources. You know, we also have teachers participating and teacher resource specialists in curriculum writing. We have permitted teachers to visit one another, um, so teachers who are not currently teaching in a multi-level have visited multi-level classrooms to see how those work. Um, we've hosted teacher panels for teachers who are currently teaching in it to answer questions for teachers who are not currently teaching multi-level yet. And, you know, we talked about feedback. And then we have teacher resource specialists uh, that will be devoted to really focusing on supporting uh, these particular multi-level classrooms to make sure that they can help with gathering resources, modeling lessons, um, doing all of the things that teacher coaches do to support teachers. And that's it. So thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions from board members? Dana? Sorry, my table's really wobbly, so. <laughs> um, I have a few questions of things that you spoke about that I wasn't really familiar with some of the terminology, so if you can repeat them. Um, so what is this academy model that you spoke about? Can you like elaborate on that? I have about five questions, so this is one of them, so. <laughs> sure, um, so right now our middle school are in teams, right. um, and it would be impossible to team high school the way it is now, but once students are in multi-level classes, they will have similar teachers. Um, we can't build teams exactly like the middle school because teachers teach five classes in high school, not four in middle school, so it becomes you know a little bigger, larger group, and te some teachers may overlap from one team to another. Um, but the students, our goal is that the students will have, like, Again, if you and you were in the same group, you would have the same math teacher, the same science teacher, um, very similar to high school. Um, because then we can build out experiences for our ninth grade students based on what house or team they're in, whether it's a team assembly or a team field trip. Those teachers can communicate with each other, especially at the beginning of the year. When high school's so overwhelming, we don't want our, our ninth graders to come in and their first experience to be three major tests on the same day. Um, right, so this will help streamline some of the communication and really help students with that eighth and ninth grade transition. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, um, okay, so you mentioned this, but I was wondering, will the students in the class know which level their classmates are in? Only if they tell each other. Um, so some kids come in and they say, yeah, I, I know because we talk to each other and we ask. Um, and then other classes we go into and they're like, we don't know. Um, but what they've been really clear about is they don't care. And they get really annoyed at us for asking this over and over and over again. They, they just, they work together and they do their thing. So it's really actually great. Okay. Um, uh, can I add sure. on to that? I think sure. another piece of that um, maybe that you're inferring or asking is related to like how do teachers know, you know, how do they give them different assessments? Um, so teachers have uh, really interesting strategies. <laughs> Some of them just are able to remember which student is which and then they just hand out the assessments. Maybe they have the college prep assessment on top, the, you know, honors assessment on the bottom and they're just kind of switching. They also intentionally try to make the assessments visually look the same right, minus a few of the questions, uh, especially the first page, so that students are not really able to tell, um, you know, what their neighbor has. Um, so that they use different strategies uh, not to really make a big deal or to single students out or to have them in any way have to let someone know what level they are. Okay, you asked, you answered this, but I want to, I want to ask it again because I wasn't, Exactly, sure. So a student can change their level at what junctures during the year? Could they change it like in the middle of the year? I or will, only within the first three weeks like it currently right. is? Right, so um, in middle school, we're gonna work with anyone and mm -hmm. meet them where they are because um, the rules for middle school and transcripts and high school diplomas are totally different, right? So. Um, Middle school, we have a lot of flexibility to work with students and meet their needs at the time that they need them met. 
Um, in high school, it's a little bit different um, because we have this 120 hour rule. Um, so to get credit in an honors class, you have to be in an honors class for 120 hours. So if you choose college prep, you have just like any other student in any other grade until October 1st to make that decision to go up and spend 120 hours at the honor, you know, with the honors class on your schedule. If you're in the honors class though, you can drop down at any time because time in that honors class counts as time in that CP class. Um, so you know, I, if, you, if I had a kid that came to me tomorrow and we talked with their parents and we realized that this truly was the best thing to, to help them at this point, we could move them down. The great thing about that is if, if we have a kid, if I have a kid who comes to me tomorrow, there's, there's something bad happening, right? Like they're, there's some stressor in their life, there's something, right? And to change their class, we used to have to change their schedule. And they would leave one class and join another and the kids would be like, hey, why did you just join our class? Now they can stay right there in the same seat, in the same group, and they don't have to tell anybody if they don't want to. Um, and that's been one of the really nice, soft landings for some of our ninth grade students who are having trouble adjusting. Okay, um, so there was uh, one of the teachers or both of the math teachers talked about levels one, two, and three, and that's like within a class, and I was a little confused what that was and how do students know which level they're in, and then I didn't understand what a focus lesson was, so I'll just. So a focus lesson is the mini lesson. That's where the skill or the content is taught. Um, it's probably what we're most familiar with. You know, it's the direct instruction component where the teacher is standing there and teaching a particular example and providing models for students. Um, so the different levels, level one, two, and three, some teachers call it mild, medium, and spicy. Others have other interesting names. Um, it really is just a way for the teachers to, dif to differentiate and provide choices for students, right? So as a, a level one would be a reteach for students who may need the concept retaught. Maybe there's a video that they can watch that accompanies the lesson that was just taught or notes that might help them to think about and, and take a step back with the skill um, so that they can then b build their confidence. You know, level two is the, the content exactly as it is, the skill as it is, um, they're able to master it, right? And then level three is that extension piece. And so this provides students access to all three of those levels. Um, and how do they make those choices, right? So really it's their readiness level. Um, if they are ready for an extension, they try that. If they feel like they're not quite ready yet, even if they're an honors kid and their goal is to be able to you know, reach that extension, um, they can start at level one, build their skill, practice, reinforce, and then take on the extension when they're prepared. Okay, thanks. And one um, other question is, are there plans to add other classes or grades in future years, or is it just gonna transition to like AP level That's classes? a really good question. At this time, we don't have that plan. Thanks, Dana. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Loy? Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the presentation. I actually had the pleasure of listening to it this morning with the uh, PTSA exec uh, boards. But I think because of that meeting, uh, there were a lot of questions that came up and I think it would be beneficial to sort of um, maybe clarify for folks, uh, especially kind of maybe what uh, Dana was saying in terms of like the focus lesson. Um, you know, there's this talk about, well, in the, in the discussion we had this morning, if you have a focus lesson, who is it geared towards? Is it geared towards the honor students or the CP students? So like that component. And then this idea, I mean, I, I was a little, what is this going on? You know, like what's happening like in the classroom? Is there like, um, how is it affecting like the CP students? Is it um, too difficult for them or the honor students? Is it not, um, you know, is it bringing them down? This idea of, of um, those students not being challenged enough. I, I mean, you guys spoke to it this morning. I thought that was really great. If you could also speak to that tonight as well. Sure, so um, one of the reasons why we showed you the eligibility um, was not to pressure people into honors courses because that's not our jam. Uh, we totally respect uh, that people choose based on their passions and their lives and, and everything like that. Um, but what that does say is that our kids are capable. 
right? Um, and so when we do that focus lesson that meets the New Jersey learning standard that everyone must meet, right? Teachers can take that opportunity to push their class and to ask extension questions and those college prep students are just as capable of answering them as the honor students. The reasons why they chose college prep are totally their own reasons, right? Um, but they're totally capable of making it. So um, teachers do pre-assessments. Teachers do formative assessment during class. That's how they check on kids and, and figure out where they are. So they gear the lessons to the needs of their class, right? They know what their class needs. Because remember, this is teaching's difficult. Whether it's a multi-level class or not, teaching's difficult. Um, and they really work to get to know their kids, get to know exactly how to target what they need. And then you heard Nick say, um, I, I ask the question and I bring everyone in, right? Um, there's a skill to that. And, and we were very fortunate to have skilled teachers and we work with them to keep increasing those skills. Just a little bit more about the New Jersey standards. Is there a new, because I know the answer, but just that the standards, uh, the New Jersey standards for these um, classes or courses, there is no differentiation between, if you could speak to that as well. Sure, so the New Jersey learning standards for algebra are the same for everyone. There's no New Jersey standards for algebra honors, right? There's no New Jersey standard for biology honors. There's only the New Jersey standards for biology. And they all take the same NJSLA. Um, so it's our duty to teach every child at the standard and to help them achieve their potential and meet the standards. Um, honors can be defined by the school district and every school district looks at it a little differently, whether it's more work or like more homework or whatever. We look at it as pushing that learning edge, right? Pushing it to go deeper. Um, we want all our kids to go deeper and again, that's why we put them in the multi-level class. So they're exposed to that. They, they may not choose to be assessed at that level, they may not want to pursue that as their passion, but we want everybody exposed to that, taking it deeper, taking it a little further. That's what honors means to us, to being able to transfer those skills to a new situation. And I know the parents, um, there is sometimes some confusion in terms of like the honors and accelerated math. How does that play into um, the, the multi-level classes? Honors and accelerated math is its own thing. Um, so they are not in a multi-level class. They are still in a single level class. Um, it's program sixth through ninth grade um, for kids that need to get accelerated, that can be accelerated a year in math. Um, by the end, they're accelerated a year. Um, but they are not taught in a multi-level math class. And just one more question. Uh, I'm always interested in what students have to say to you. Like the student feedback is interesting because my student doesn't really give me any feedback. So I'm always curious, you know, like what students think. <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, a lot of the things that were said were, were great. Was there any feedback from students that you guys heard that was like, you know what, this isn't working? Or just some constructive feedback about how to make it, you know, um, you know, like a better experience or what's working or what's not. Um, yeah, I guess maybe the what's not working part. I really can only think of one example, I, I'm being honest, um, it, at least in the classes that I visited, you know, one student who actually was in the accelerated class um, and ended up um, not being in that class and, you know, that particular student said that um, he would like more opportunities for additional extension, right? So that was really the only feedback that I heard that was negative. Thanks, Loy. Uh, Pooja? Would, uh, the, would the multi-level classes have roughly an equal amount of honors and CP students? That's a really great question. No, we, we probably have more students that choose honors, right? But we do try to break up. So for example, you know, I don't know, there are approximately eight to nine students that choose college prep in each of the sections. But we do have more students who choose honors. So they can't really be split half and half. Any other, any other questions over here? No? Thank you so Great. much for the Thank opportunity. Thank you very much, appreciate it. 
So then that takes us now to the first opportunity for public comments. The board invites thoughts and reactions on agenda items and items of concern from members of our community who are present. Each participant is asked to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement, which will be limited to three minutes in accordance with board policy 0167. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. This public comment period shall be limited to 60 minutes. Starry greetings, it's night time, Makran Bidway, Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, on 16th of November, I had the opportunity to, to visit my daughter's uh, sixth grade and eighth grade class, and I promised the building leader that I'll write something. So my apologies to all three of them, the two educators and the leader, but I'm going to do this here much better. Uh, first, early morning, I went to the sixth grade class, which was a social studies class. And uh, the teacher or the educator was also the homeroom teacher. And she had a beautiful plan where she had a word of mouth communication and a written communication. And she was trying to elicit which is reliable, which is better. And she did a good job. And I was immersed in it. Uh, with my sixth grader and her friends and classmates. That was the first part of that class. The next part was bartering. There were uh, cut pieces of uh, paper with you know, bread and baskets and eggs and whatnot. And I didn't understand in the beginning and I started losing. And then I realized, oh, this is how it's done. So I tried to level it up with the kids. But anyway, it worked well. Uh, what impression I brought home from that was there was a perfect synergy there. The educator, the students, they were all properly aligned. There was no disruption. I have seen disruptions in many American classrooms and other countries that I have visited. There was none here. Uh, it's just a blessing to be, be an educator in this district, which most of them probably are having their best time. I don't know if all classes are like that, but this was there. So after that, I went to the next class, which was the eighth grade uh, advanced uh, HNA algebra, algebra two. And in that class, there were puzzles. And I got engrossed in a puzzle with my daughter and another friend of hers, or table mate. And then I switched, and then there was other things going on. And I got my own basket and started doing things. Of course, I didn't finish it. And there were a lot of things, right? This is how learning happens. So I was impressed and I was very happy. And I can assure you that there is no problem with all these things happening. Uh, it's, it's a nice thing and I really feel bad that I waited five, six months to bring this out. I'll be apologizing to those two educators uh, for not bringing this up sooner or writing them a nice email. Thank you. I'll be back later. Thank you. Any other comments? Sonia Gawas, 28 Melville Road. Um, just for disclosure, I am on West Windsor Council, but I'm here as a parent and a community member. Ty, you probably have already heard what I'm going to say next, um, last night. Um, it's just personal. I want to bring um, attention to um, the community, and I pardon pardon me if I get I lose my emotions today. Um, just about a year ago, I was here um, again, bringing attention to some of the unfortunate things that are happening in our middle school in our community, bullying. Um, I bought, my daughter was bullied um, for being darker skinned last year. Um, she's been bullied for being a different student, struggling student because she has IEP. Um, the most recent is she's being um, targeted for being adopted uh, because she doesn't have real parents. Um, 
not complaining um, about what the administration has or has not done. I think administration has done a wonderful job handling it, but I just want to bring this um, to attention to our community. I think as a community, we are failing if we cannot um, guide our younger um, children who are the future of this world. So I just want to bring to the attention that we need to do something um, as a community because um, our younger students, our younger children are watching us, right? They learn from us. How we act as a community is what they pick on and then they respond to it. My daughter has been, there, there have been words thrown at her. There have been wor N words thro thrown at her, left and right, okay? They have, she's been called things. Anybody who knows my daughter knows she's a sweet girl. She wants to be friends with everyone. She wants to help everyone, even if that means that she puts her feelings in the back seat. As a parent, it's my job to take care of her. I know these other young students who are troubled need help and guidance but not at the cost of my child. So if anything we can do here to support our students, I really urge. I've reached out to the school administration. I've even offered, and I'm not sure if it's even po possible, I've offered if I can go in the school and talk to the students about adoption. Families become families in many different ways. So that I'm, I'm offering to the Board of Ed here if that is a possibility, I offer myself, my husband, to come and talk to the students about adoption or different ways of becoming families. If that's one thing that could help, and pardon me um, if I can just finish, if that could help our students learn and grow from it and not trouble students who are different. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Okay. Seeing none, I will close the public comment portion. We'll now go to Board of Education Committee reports. Can I have a report from the Administration Facilities Committee? Dana? Hi, good evening. Um, the Administration and Facilities Committee met on Tuesday. May 16th, the committee reviewed um, the following policies and regulations which are recommended for first reading at tonight's board meeting. There are um, a policy 5200 and regulation of the same number on attendance, um, policy 8140 and regulation of the same number of student enrollments and enrollment accounting. Um, policy 8330 and regulation 8330 on student records, and um, policy 1125, which is benefits covering non-affiliated community education staff, category E. Next, the committee reviewed the, um, another set of policies and regulations and recommended them for a second reading and approval at tonight's board meeting. This is um, policy 5305, health services personnel, Policy 5308, student health records, the um, accompanying regulation, 5308 on um, student health records. Policy 5310 on health services, along with the regulation, 5310 on health services, and policy 7440 on school district security. We next got an update on referendum projects. The High School North and Millstone River HVAC projects have closed out. Landscaping is, is planned outside the High School North dance studio. Plumbing and electrical work has started in the High School North culinary arts room, while walls in the media center are ready to be primed and painted. Phase one construction at the Wyckoff School is closing out, while phase two ductwork and media center demolition is underway. Furniture will be delivered soon for the Millstone River and Dutch Neck School media centers with uh, finishing touches also underway in those two centers. The committee discussed district health services needs and priorities and the end of the COVID-19 public health emergency, which, um, which ended on May 11th. We reviewed the um, 20, 
2023-2024 contract for the advancement via individual determination, otherwise known as the AVID program, offered at both High School North and South. We discussed the next steps in the school start time process. The school start time explore Exploration Committee was to hold its first meeting on Monday, May 22nd, 2023, and will, and will include community stakeholders representing the Board of Education, students, parents, the WWP Education Association, school and, and school and district administration. The focus of the meeting was to be current, to, to read current and applicable research on school start times as related to both student health and well-being. The committee will next meet in June. Back to the ANF committee, we reviewed updated job descriptions for the administrative assistant, I mean, administrative analyst, assistant superintendent of personnel, athletic director, chief academic officer, chief equity officer, deputy superintendent of schools, director of counseling, mini explorers assistant instructor, mini explorers instructor, and school nurse coordinator. The committee recommends these job descriptions for approval on tonight's agenda. And our committee will next meet on Tuesday, June 6th. Thank you, Dana. Any questions from board members? Okay, we'll turn next to the curriculum committee report. Lloyd. Thanks, Rachel. The curriculum committee met on May 16th. Uh, we began the meeting with uh, Dr. Barbara Gould and Andrew Bean attending um, and providing an overview of the multi-level classes, which we heard tonight. Um, next, Dr. Adahald reviewed an updated score within the instruction program section of the NJ QSAC. The updated score report was provided to all New Jersey districts due to a released update on standardized uh, score reports in science. The change in score was a decrease of 0.1 and had no impact on the overall summary score. Uh, then uh, the committee reviewed Dr. Nathan's merit goal submission. Uh, the committee recommends the submission of Dr. Nathan's merit goal to the executive county superintendent for their review and approval. Uh, next, I'll review several items, well, a lot of items actually on tonight's agenda to be voted on, um, to be voted on. Uh, first, begin with the Education Services Commission of New Jersey, non-public schools, uh, to authorize a fourth year of a five-year agreement um, with the Educational Services Commission of New Jersey to provide administration of non-public funds for non-public school students within the district in accordance with the State Board of Education guidelines as required, um, 192-193 services for non-public instructional services to non-public school students within the district. Um, in accordance with the State Board of Education guidelines under Public Law 1977, Chapters 192 and 193. Uh, next, non-public nursing services in accordance with the New Jersey non-public nursing law guidelines under Public Law 1991, Chapter 226. Non-public technology initiative program pursuant to the requirements of the New Jersey non-public school technology initiative program. Non-public textbook services in accordance with the requirement of the New Jersey textbook law, NJSA uh, 18A colon 58-37.1. Non-public uh, Title III and Title III Immigrant Funds Administration pursuant to the requirements of the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001. Non-public security aid program funds administration pursuant to the requirements of the New Jersey non-public um, security aid programs. Uh, and the non-public uh, IDEA B funds administration in accordance with the IDEA um, Act Part B. The committee recommends the continuation of this um, Five, again, four or five year agreement with the Educational Services Commission. Uh, next, moving on to professional development. The curriculum committee recommends approval of the following professional development. First, uh, one science teacher to attend Ready, Set, Go. K, it's a K-5 climate change education conference at the College of New Jersey, uh, June 1st at no cost uh, 
no, at a cost <laughs> to not exceed uh, $350, including mileage. Uh, one staff to attend a one-week Teachers College Summer Foundational Reading in the Upper Grade Institute. Uh, it's virtually from the 31st of July of this summer and to August 3rd at a cost of $850 per person. And one P environmental one AP environmental science teacher to attend APSI at Rutgers University um, from July 10th to the uh, July 13th, 2023, not to exceed $1,250. Um, okay, and then next, I'm sorry. I got those. Okay, uh, next, professional development consultants. Uh, the curriculum committee recommends the following. Uh, Cal Solutions to provide two one-day leading dual language programs for student success workshops during the summer of this upcoming summer to dual language immersion uh, district leadership administrators at a cost not to exceed $11,093. And this is for 20 district administrators. Uh, next, Dr. Pledger Fedora to present uh, Orton Gillingham Academy 30 hour classroom educator training from September 11th through September 15th virtually um, to districts EIS and reading recovery and re reading interventionist teachers at a cost not to exceed $21,850. And this is for 17 district reading um, and reading interventionists and teachers. Uh, Next, Center for Responsive Classrooms to provide a four-day core course training uh, this summer to elementary and middle school teachers at a cost not to exceed $24,900, and that would be for 30 elementary school uh, teachers. Moving on to professional contracts, uh, the curriculum committee recommends approval of a, district of a district membership in professional development school network at the College of New Jersey um, for the 23-24 school year at a cost of $3,750, and that includes membership um, registration for one staff member in each uh, teachers as scholars seminar. Uh, next for the technology portion, Got a long list here. So, <laughs> um, first, the curriculum committee recommends approval of these the following educational contracts for technology platforms and databases. First, approve one year agreement with Genesis Educational Services to provide system maintenance, including lesson planner for the Genesis Student Information System, Genesis Staff Management System, and Payroll System. Interfaces for Versa Trans, IEP Direct, NJIIS, Registration Gateway, Destiny Foley, Cafe Prepay, ASAP, School Messenger, One Roaster, Link It, Pay School, Grade uh, Assignment, Lunch Tracking, and Secure Backup Services for the 23-24 school year at a total cost of $60,148. Uh, one year agreement with EMS Link Inc. to provide registration gateway uh, premium platform for student registration that integrates with the district's student information system from July 1st of this year to June 30th, 2024, at a cost of $42,542 and change. One year agreement with uh, JAMF to provide management of apps and software on Apple devices from July of this year through June of next year at a cost of $22,433. One year agreement with Adobe Education to provide Adobe Creative Cloud software, 500 licenses from the 1st of July of this year to June 30th of next at a total cost of 12,500. One year agreement with Microsoft to provide district Microsoft licenses, including Windows Office, um, server software and email from October 1st, 2023 through August 31st, 2024, at a cost of $66,936. One year agreement with the Tech Smart Notebook Suite to provide smart learning suite software, 300 licenses from July 1st of this year through June 30th of next year, at a total cost of $9,075. One year agreement with Veritas to provide backup software for district servers from July 27th of this year through July 26th of next, uh, at a cost of $2,458. One year agreement with the uh, Funds for Learning, LLC, to provide E-rate services from July 1st of this year through June 30th of next, at a cost not to exceed 3950 Renewal of an annual contract with Millennium Communications for, Gen, uh, for Genetech 
for building door access security, including one Synergis Enterprise Reader and routine maintenance checkup and system updates for the 1st of August of this year through July 31st of next for $7,597. Annual service renewal with uh, Entrado Interactive Services Corporation to provide school messenger web hosting services, content management, and unlimited notification services for the 23-24 school year at a cost of $27,089. One-year agreement with Raptor Technologies to provide Eyes on the Door software and support from July 1st of this year through June 30th of next at a cost of $6,250. One-year agreement with uh, CDWG to provide single wire support, maintenance of district's notification system, uh, communication between the district security system, door access, and alarms to outside police and fire. Uh, that's from July 27th of this year through July 26th of 2024 at a cost of $14,932. One-year agreement with the CDWG to provide a VMware support and maintenance of remote desktop licenses that provide access to district resources from outside of the district from July 25th of this year through July 24th of next at a cost of $14,096. So... Yes, the committee recommends yes on all those. Next, field trips. Um, the committee recommends approval for these overnight field trips. First, middle school and high school future problem solvers to the University of Massachusetts Amherst from June 7th through Ju June 11th of this year. The cost of the trip is approximately $1,200 per student. Um, middle school and high school National History Day students to College Park, Maryland from June 11th through the 15th, and the cost of that trip is approximately $500 per student. Uh, high school students of America to Dallas um, from June 20th through the June 25th, and the cost of that trip is approximately $1,700 per student. So. And then some travel approval. Um, we recommend approval of first two advisors to accompany the middle school and high school students to the Future Problem Solvers International Competition, um, as I mentioned, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst from the 7th of June to, through the 11th this year. The cost of the trip, again, for the teachers would be would, is not to exceed 1200 per teacher. That's including travel. And then one advisor to accompany National Day middle school and high school students students to College Park, Maryland um, from the 11th through the 15th of June of this year, and the cost of the trip is not to exceed $1,000, including travel. Um, and then curriculum. The committee recommends approval of um, the, the following new curriculum, which is one on here. It's the Introduction to Data Science. And last but not least, there is a correction on item number seven on the curriculum and instruction portion of the agenda. It's just a date correction, date correction, excuse me. Um, the date should, should read September 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. And our committee will next meet on June 6th. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Loy. Any questions from board members? Okay, we'll now turn to the Finance Committee report. Shweta. Thank you, Rachel. The Finance Committee uh, met on Tuesday, May 16th. The committee reviewed the monthly financial reports. The administration certified that there are sufficient funds to complete the year. The committee also reviewed agenda items for today's meeting. This included the 23-24 professional service rate renewals. The food service, custodial service, trash and recycling services are on the agenda for approval as well. There are motions to approve a deposit into capital reserve on June 30th, the establishment of petty cash amounts for the year, and the requisition of taxes and lunch rates for the 23-24 school year. Also on the agenda are motions to approve a referendum change order, co-op purchases over the bid limit, obsolete equipment disposal, and the renewal of transportation contracts. In addition, employee travel, joint purchasing agreements, shared service agreements, and national cooperative purchasing contracts are on the agenda for approval tonight. Um, staff provided updates on district construction, which Dana just reviewed, um, so I won't repeat them all, but I will just add that um, bids were received today for the town center media center renovations and are being reviewed. 
bids for Maurice Hawk and Village will be received in June. Staff also provided an update on cafeteria operations. The district is required to raise the price of lunch by 10 cents as per the paid lunch equity tool that the state requires school districts to use to determine the price of breakfast and lunch. Since the federal reimbursements have increased, the district must increase the prices. For the 23-24 school year, breakfast will be serviced for kindergarten through fifth grade at $2.25. The high school breakfast will increase to $2.50, which is a 25 cent increase due to the pricing tool. In April, the number of breakfasts dropped from 952 to 446, and lunches dropped from 59,146 to 31,032. Um, there were less serving days in April due to spring break. Sodexo was able to add an additional employee during the month at High School North. Um, there was also a bid for new walk-in refrigerator freezers at Town Center, Village, and Maurice Hawk, but no bids were submitted. To date, 231,000 of the 412,000 supply chain assistance funds have been spent. These funds do not expire until the end of the 23-24 school year. To spend the local food for school supply chain assistance funds, two new vendors were approved. On April 27th, a local food day occurred where fresh pasta and vegetables were served to students that were made or grown locally. We start serving breakfast at Town Center on May 1st, and we have been averaging 14 breakfasts per day. Staff also shared that Sodexo is going to pilot LeanPath, which is a food waste determining software to monitor their production of food waste. Lastly, the administration shared the hourly rate chart for the 23-24 school year. On January 1st, 2024, the minimum wage is $15 per hour. Our next finance meeting is scheduled for June 15th. Thank you, Shweta. Any questions from board members? Okay. All right, we'll now move to the voting portion of our meeting. Can I have a motion for administration items one through nine, Dana and Robin? Any questions or comments? Chris? Okay, we'll start with Ms. Bonso. Yes. <coughs> Next is Ms. Crude. Yes. Ms. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Zovich. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. Okay, can I have a motion for curriculum items one through seven um, with the correction mentioned by Loy earlier? Uh, Loy and Puja. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll yes. start with Ms. Crude. Yes. Ms. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Zovich. Yes. Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. Can I have a motion for uh, finance items one through 54 plus the blue addendum? Uh, Shweta and Dana, any questions or comments? Okay, yes. we'll start with Ms. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Zovich. Yes. Ms. Bonso. Yes. Ms. Krug. Yes, except um, it's um, abstaining on the blue addendum number 9A. On blue 9A. Yes. Okay. And next, Ms. Juliana. Uh, yes, and just abstaining on item 46 under the heading New Jersey State Contracts. It's category M4006. M4006. Okay. Got it. Right. Motion passes. Uh, we go now to personnel items. Can I get a motion for items one through four plus the green addendum? Uh, and Loy and Robin, any questions or comments? Chris? Okay, we'll start with Ms. Shetty. Yes. Ms. Ovich. Yes. Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Ms. Brew. Yes. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. And uh, we, tonight we also voted on some retirements, so I'd like to acknowledge those. We have uh, Lisa Bremer, who is an elementary teacher from Village, retiring after 29 and a half years in the district. We have David Miller, who's a computers teacher at High School South, retiring after 21 years in the district. 
and Karen or Orlovsky, elementary teacher from Village, retiring after 36 years in the district. So just want to thank all of you for your years of service and dedication uh, to this school district, and we wish you all uh, well in your retirement. So thank you. Uh, so I'll now move to uh, approval of our board minutes. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes from April 25th and May 9th? Uh, Pooja and Shweta. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Yes. Um, abstaining from uh, A, okay. for April 25th. Thank you. Okay. Any board liaison reports? Okay. Any new business? Right. So that takes us to the second opportunity for public comments. The board invites comments from members of our community who are present. Each participant is asked to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement, which will be limited to three minutes in accordance with board policy 0167. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. This public comment period shall be limited to 15 minutes. Starry greetings, Makran Bidway, Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, this district has lost uh, 700 students between 2018 and 2022, October 15, which is the kind of count that the state keeps. Last time I brought the issue of uh, brain drain, and the superintendent found it insulting. How is it insulting? This school has the best and the brightest, this district. We are losing 700 students, or 659, or 675, whatever that number is. It's, it's close to 700. Uh, and, and the kids are gone, that means their parents are gone. So that is brain drain, because these are the brightest people. I don't know how that is insulting. Yes, it is insulting that they are turning their back on us, not on me, but obviously on something that's not related to schools, but outside the school, in this room, in this building, right? So it's not insult from me, it's the insult of parents that they've been ignored. Coming back to this late start, nobody's there. This is the third time this has happened. In 2015, parents told me there was a parent movement and somebody snubbed it. In 2018, with the referendum, there was a parent movement and somebody snubbed it. This year also, it's been snubbed. I understand there is a committee, but committees are graveyards for most beautiful ideas. We don't need a committee, we need a panel of three, uh, the, the, super, the assistant superintendent sitting here next to me, the, the assistant superintendent who is in charge right now, and the union leader, because I think she is in charge of over eight, 900 uh, you know, union employees, and there needs to be a punch list. And you can still implement it by September 2023 if you want to. So I want the superintendent to come on camera and decide and, and, and make, a, make a call that does he believe in the doctor's orders? Because I have emails from my, my own situation with my own daughter that he challenged the doctor. Is he challenging the AAP doctors? What's holding this up? I mean, we have a committee with 20 plus members what is this, National Academy of Science? I, 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 I don't want to get into this, but I want to be making this very quick right now. The superintendent said many meetings ago that he is not going anywhere. I tried to Oprah his, uh, uh, his annual evaluations. I know connect, in Connecticut they are required by law to be given to parents or whoever asked them. I don't know what the law in New Jersey is, uh, but the, the lady told me it's, it can't be done. So I'm now requesting the superintendent to release all his 14 years of annual evaluations in an email to 9,000 parents. And if we won't do it, then I will come back in the next meeting and take the next All right, step. Thank, thank you. Are there any other comments? Hi, Debbie Baer, I'm the, uh, one of the vice presidents of the WWPEA. I'd like to go back to how hard the teachers are working, how long our school year has been, and really how creative we are. I was so impressed at the first comment about how engrossing lessons were at sixth grade and eighth grade. Mm, I guess not. 
<laughs> uh, because they are. I taught middle school for 13 years. We have always worked together as teams and we have always made lessons hands-on and working together. And it's so nice to see this moving up to ninth grade so that that transition between the middle school experience and the high school experience can be a smoother one. And um, it was so nice to hear also about how the teachers are being creative as we move forward with those innovative ideas that sometimes have a little pushback and lots of people have ideas about how to work best. So thank you very much for helping us push forward, try new things. I appreciate your leadership, Dr. Adderholt. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Uh, with that, I will be closing the second opportunity for public comments. Before recessing into closed session, if I may, um, Mr. Toscano, I know there was a mention of, uh, of an OPA request that I, if you would clarify at least the, the rules around that, sure. I think that would uh, appreciate that. The, under the Open Public Records Act, uh, personnel records are generally exempt uh, from disclosure unless specifically excluded or excuse me included um, under the statutory scheme um, evaluations are not subject to Oprah for any public employee Thank you, Mr. Um, all right so I will uh, we need to recess into closed executive session, so I will need to read this uh, statement. Whereas the Open Public Meetings Act authorizes boards of education to meet in executive session under certain circumstances, whereas the Open Public Meetings Act requires the board to adopt a resolution at a public meeting to go into private session, now therefore be it resolved by the West Windsor Plainsboro Regional School District Board of Education that it is necessary to meet an executive session to discuss certain items involving the superintendent evaluation. Be it further resolved that any discussion held by the board which need not remain confidential will be made public as soon as feasible. The minutes of the executive session will not be disclosed until the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Be it further resolved that the board will not return to open session to conduct business at the conclusion of the executive session. So can I get a motion to adjourn to closed session? Uh, Pooja and Loy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone.